Hello, everybody. This is Mark Matusik. I hope you're having a great weekend. Today, we're going to be talking about pathways to intimacy uh, and the importance of sustaining deep, meaningful connection in the process of awakening. As the subtitle of this talk from Emerson suggests, be silly, be honest, be kind. Until we learn to drop our defenses and relax the fears uh, and self-protective ego, life becomes uh, a distant and unheartfelt affair. When we take ourselves too seriously, it's impossible to be humble or open with ourselves or other people, you know, not to mention our spiritual source. And this dearth of intimacy can rob our existence of warmth, uh, texture, and a sense of belonging. So what do we mean by intimacy? And why is it inseparable from an awakened life? In the sense that I'm using it, intimacy speaks to our human ability to transcend the boundaries of the limited uh, me in order to engage more deeply and nourishingly with our own existence. It means recognizing ourselves as integral parts of a larger whole, never distant, and never alone. Intimacy brings a shared sense of presence. The closer we come to the beating heart of life, the more the world and its inhabitants become our familiars. As feelings of intimacy increase, uh, the veils of fear, uh, entitlement, and separation fall away, while the sense of brotherhood and sisterhood increases. Uh, alongside harmony with ourselves. I recently came across a passage uh, in an upcoming book called The Way of the Rose that captures what I mean by intimacy. It was written by a couple of friends of mine named Clark Strand and Perdita Finn. Uh, and it is an exploration of the rosary, the rosary, not as a Catholic tradition, but as an ancient practice that predated Christianity by millennia. In the approach to uh, the rosary that they're describing, uh, it, it's meant to unite us with the divine feminine, the feminine principle that's hidden at the heart uh, of this ancient circular praying of beads. Uh, and this is the passage that I found compelling. Quote, the more we pray the rosary for our own heart's desire, the easier it becomes to hear the prayers of the world around us. The Queen Anne's lace forcing its green stalks through the concrete at the edge of the road is praying. The deer stepping through the deep snow is praying. The monarch butterfly, the last of a mighty migration, emerging from its chrysalis on a leaf of milkweed, is lost in prayer. All of it is prayer, they write. Isn't that wonderful? Then they continue, quote, to begin to listen and to speak with the heart is to re-enter those lost conversations and recover those languages of prayer. The simple truth of the rosary is that everything prays. The world is nothing but one vast interconnected prayer. Once we know this, loneliness disappears forever from our lives. The clouds pray their way to the mountains. The mountains pray for rain. Life is relationship. Nothing exists alone. No one is ever alone, unquote. Now, this radical interpretation of the rosary teaches us an essential lesson about our human existence, namely that we only exist in relationship to one another. That in a very real sense, there is no you without me or me without you. If I can't recognize you as myself, I can never really know myself. I'm not talking about personality. I, I'm referring to essence, the uppercase S, uh, which all of us share identically. That your self, your large capital S self, is myself and vice versa. This is the single most important fact of our lives, and it's also the, very, the most difficult for self-conscious material beings to comprehend. And that's why we cherish those moments so dearly 
uh, when separation falls away and we can simply be with other people uh, who are also allowing themselves to just be with us. No pretense, no mask, no performance, no ego. Just the experience of dropping all that uh, and not trying so hard, not performing. By definition, intimacy comes from not trying. And it draws its sweetness from this very absence of effort. While we can help to create the conditions for intimacy, we can't force intimacy into being. You know, as with all spiritual experiences, including love, you know, we can only make way for them to happen. We can't think our way to intimacy any more than we can think our way to spiritual connection. That's one of the mistakes uh, of some couples therapy, uh, in my opinion, where more attention is paid at times to painstaking effort and analysis than to nonverbal communication. Now, talking uh, can be a healing experience, of course, but our deepest intimacy comes in silence when two people are so at ease with one another that they're able to not talk and still feel comfortable and connected. You know, aware of their essential uh, self, uh, the, 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 the sameness uh, of themselves at their core. No gap to bridge, no loneliness to assuage, no desperate attempt not to feel insecure. Just two uh, individuals being quiet together and feeling visible and safe and in sync. So intimacy is an emotional exchange. It's an emotional exchange that is generative, expansive, and life-enhancing. If it's true that all things uh, are engaged in a form of prayer, it's also true that everything alive is intimate. The only thing that prevents us from knowing and feeling this is the self-absorbed mind. I had a very powerful experience last year that showed me uh, firsthand just how obstructive the mind is when it comes to intimacy and how that can change when we shift our consciousness away from division and toward union. For several years, uh, friends of mine have been telling me about their spiritual experiences with botanical substances such as ayahuasca, psilocybin, uh, and they've invited me to join them on these plant journeys uh, as they call them, many times. But the time was never quite right for me. Also, I had had my share of LSD trips in my teens, and I had no interest in tripping again. It had taken me a long time to get my head straight, and the last thing I wanted was to lose it, uh, even for a few hours. But then, one night last summer, uh, in August, uh, I changed my mind. <laughs> and I found myself at a, at a very dear friend's house participating in a ceremony uh, using an African vine that's called kana, uh, which is fermented uh, into a capsule form. Uh, and, and my friends promised me it was not an intense high. It was, it's what they call an, an empathogen. It's, it's a heart opening substance. It's not a hallucinogenic substance. So the four of us sat down together in a circle, um, and we each set our intention for the journey, which is, which is an important part of this process, you know, something that we wanted to change or, or, or reveal or, or release in our lives. And I knew, I knew exactly what my intention needed to be, uh, and I stated it clearly to myself uh, before, uh, before we, uh, we uh, took the medicine. Within an hour, this plant teacher uh, had, had started sending warm rays, <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it, into my chest and, and relaxing my nerves. I was aware that as my thoughts started to subside, that the boundary that usually separates me from the world had begun to dissolve without my knowing it. I found myself experiencing an openness and an ease that was completely new and allowed me to connect with these people who I'd known for decades in a far more intimate way. As the plant journey continued, we, we opened our hearts to one another with, with extreme candor, and we shared some of our most difficult uh, thoughts and feelings. As we did this, uh, fear and self-consciousness just fell away. 
you know, over the over the period of the night, there was crying, there was laughing, there was even some howling you know, when one of us touched on uh, uh, on the center of a wound that we needed to heal. And as we went through our processes, we 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 attended to one another, you know, holding each other's hands, rubbing each other's feet, comforting one another, you know, embracing without the usual defenses. This intense, beautiful ceremony went on for close to eight hours. And when I woke up in my bed a few hours uh, later, I felt fresh and rested and, and completely lucid. There was none of the, the usual physical or emotional hangover that you get from drugs or alcohol. I remembered everything that had happened, including the insights that I'd had about my issue. And I can tell you, honestly, this was one of the most transformative experiences of my life. Also, that wound that I had hoped to heal in that cer ceremony has never actually troubled me since that night uh, nine months ago. Now, it would be easy to attribute this healing to the magic capsules that we swallowed. Uh, and, and of course, the power of Kana, this plant teacher, can't be denied. But what stuck with me more than anything else was the depth of closeness that I felt with my friends, the absence of separation or effort. The, the complete non-interference of the judging, defensive, storytelling mind. The, the mind that narrates our experiences and cuts us off from the world and, and other people. It was gone. It just fell away for eight hours. And this preternatural intimacy made me aware of how unintimate I am in much of my life. Restricted uh, by, by pride, by fear, by composure, by uh, self you know, self-consciousness. I realized how I distanced myself from other people, even though I consider myself to be a fairly open person. Now, no doubt many of you have had your own examples of how substances, including alcohol, can, can help us drop egotistical masks and expose ourselves in quite unusual ways. You know, there's a reason the ancient recommended in vino veritas, you know, knowing the power of wine to loosen inhibitions and bring forth the truth. Now, while I'm not, I'm not recommending drunkenness or drugs, including plant medicines, you know, as prerequisites to intimacy, of course, but it is valuable to learn from these substances and incorporate the openness and honesty of intoxication into our sober, mindful lives. I may never do a plant journey again, but I now know experientially what unconditional intimacy feels like. Uh, and then I'm capable of being far more uh, unguarded and transparent and trusting uh, than, than I usually am. And that is a precious awareness to have. So ask yourself, where is intimacy limited in your own life? Are you able to be alone and profoundly comfortable with yourself? Are you capable of engaging without fear or self-consciousness with those you love? In the presence of other people, are you able to recognize them as yourself, that essential self that we all share, uh, and, and, and be truthful in your communication? You, can you be silly, as, as, as Ralph Waldo Emerson recommends? You know, drop your guards, stop trying to impress. And, and can you offer kindness without pulling back or keeping score or, or suppressing the generosity within you that wants to be shared and celebrated? What are the obstacles to intimacy in your life and what can you do to heal them? These are essential questions to ask ourselves on, on the path of awakening and freedom. So uh, before we close, I'd like to say just a few things about intimacy as it appears uh, in the realms of the body, the mind, and the spirit. So let's start with the, the, the body, the physical. According to William James, the philosopher, Touch is the alpha and omega of affection. Okay? Touch is the alpha and omega of affection. We know ourselves first as physical creatures and how we're touched or not as children has everything to do with whether we're able to love and connect with others later in life. The simple act of holding a child, looking into its eyes, letting it know that it's safe, comforting it when it's hurt or scared, and showing it by example that its body is precious it you know, goes a long way toward creating a person capable of physical intimacy. This in intimacy can range from the ability to look another person in the eye, 
uh, to communicating affection through a handshake, you know, to receiving and offering a warm embrace, uh, all the way to sexual connection. But it is a sign of our over-sexualized times that physical intimacy is often used synonymously with sex. You know, when in fact sexuality is only one of myriad ways to express and, and receive physical intimacy. Healing touch comes in many forms, and particularly in times of isolation and stress. A healing touch can have wondrous effects uh, on a human being. I know a woman who credits her body work with helping her heal from cancer, for example. I know another guy who was brought up in a very repressed family who is only now in his 40s learning to let himself be touched and to touch others without extreme uh, discomfort. I know another couple who were, who were experiencing sexual issues, who have started uh, attending tantra workshops where they explore each other's bodies without any erotic agenda. Uh, and they're finding this process to be remarkably helpful. And I know someone else who teaches self-loving workshops that involve physical stimulation uh, and coming to appreciate the intimate liberation of what she calls sex for one. So regardless of how they manifest, Physical touch and intimacy are inseparable from well-being and shouldn't be ignored, you know, particularly by spiritual seekers who are sometimes tempted by the prospect of self-transcendence. It, 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 it's so important uh, to resist the fundamentalism uh, of, of, of setting, spirit, uh, oppose, uh, you know, setting spirit apart from body uh, and, and turning it into turning body into uh, a nemesis or brother ass or, or whatever you want to, to call it something lower than the spirit it's, it's, it's a big mistake now let's move on to emotional intimacy it's um, as important it, as it is to recognize that language can be enormously helpful in dealing with personal feelings uh, and understanding the feelings of other people Words really are an obstacle to deeper connection very often. While language may open the door, it can't engender intimacy beyond what the brain can comprehend, what the mind can take in. And that's why I mentioned earlier that couples therapy uh, only takes people so far when it's all about talking and analyzing and pushing uh, and ignoring the intimate properties of silence. And, and letting the other person be, making space for them to simply be as they are. If you have any doubt about the intimate power of silence, just watch how uncomfortable people get when you stop filling the air with words and just let yourself be present and quiet. Notice how difficult it is not to speak, not to create a barrier of words to protect ourselves from feeling vulnerable and exposed. Emotional intimacy requires space. And, that, and that's the paradox. Without the ability to step apart and not paper over the gap with compulsive talking, it's hard to feel one another's presence. When we learn to use verbal communication as the icebreaker and then silence as the binding agent that connects us once the words uh, die down, we become emotionally intimate with others through relaxed non-effort. We learn to trust the silence to sustain us once we've spoken our peace and resist the urge to talk each other to death. When it comes to emotional intimacy within ourselves, the same principle applies. You know, there are times for self-talk, for journaling, for therapy, for explaining our, our, our thoughts and feelings in words. And there are times to just shut up and simply be in our skins, such as we are in, in meditation or other forms of, of contemplation. In fact, it's precisely this silence of self-encounter and solitude that many seekers find the most intimidating and difficult. If you've ever been on a silent retreat, you, you, you've seen how hard it is to be with people and to feel their intimate presence without being able to communicate verbally. You know, people can find it quite unbearable. During one of my writing retreats a few years back, I, I invited the guests to uh, keep silent during lunch. Uh, and I practically had a mutiny on my hands. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the, the, the response. They complained as if I were you know, demanding cruel and unusual punishment. And they just simply refused to go along with it. 
know, of course, I had suggested it for their own benefit to allow them the private mental space for reflection and creativity while they while they ate their lunch, uh, which is something that I enjoy. But clearly, they they did not want it. They were having none of it. So notice how you may avoid silence in your own life uh, and how this interferes with emotional uh, intimacy. And finally, we come to spiritual intimacy, the capacity for connection to our common source. The universal longing for spiritual intimacy uh, is, is proven by the religious impulse itself that's typified our, our species from the very beginning. Since the dawn of time, human beings have invented rituals and traditions designed to bring communi uh, communities together under a common roof in order to dissolve egotistical distance and remind us, at least for one hour a week on Sundays, uh, that we share a common creator. That the self we bow to in one another, whether we're shaking hands at church or we're saluting to the divinity of the other through the namaste sign, uh, this self is identical in all of us. Spiritual intimacy reminds us that we are indeed brothers and sisters in one great family with a shared origin and destination. And that destination is to be spiritual beings in a mortal form, charged with this mandate to know ourselves, to remember our essence, and then to recognize it in others as well, uh, in time to learn to love one another uh, and, and honor one another as ourselves before we leave this planet. That's the greatest intimacy of all, this awareness of our inextricable bond with all beings alive and dead. And after we feel this kind of intimacy, really feel it in our bones, our lives are, are never the same again. The doorways to this intimacy are humility and surrender. Humility and surrender, our greatest spiritual allies. Humility and surrender enable us to relax the will, to open the heart, to drop our defenses, and to offer ourselves to this unifying power that, that animates and connects us. There's nothing to do, we realize. There's no one we need to become. Instead, we're just simply invited to be as we are and to know ourselves as progeny of this same great source. And that's the true meaning of spiritual intimacy. Okay. Recognizing all that exists as family supported by uh, this love, this force of love that we can't control, that, but uh, can learn to make way for moment by moment in our lives. So that's what I wanted to say to you today about spiritual, about uh, pathways to intimacy. And now, Jay, why don't we open up the lines and have some conversation? I'm very curious to know, folks, if you have uh, any uh, experience with obstacles to physical, emotional, or spiritual intimacy, and what you may have learned uh, in your own lives uh, about how to transcend those obstacles, or if you have any questions about that, we would absolutely love to hear from you. <laughs> 